Hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. This is episode 343. Today, we're talking about a historical figure from the martial arts, Juan Cook Lee. If you're new to the show, you may not know my voice. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick. And I love my job because I get to talk about martial arts, meet martial artists, and help design martial arts products. If you want to see any of those products, head on over to whistlekick.com. You can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on anything over there. We also have products on Amazon, but you're not going to get that code there. Whatever works for you, check it out. If you want show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go, including transcripts. We're getting better. Transcripts are hitting pretty close to when the episodes are released, and we're still going back and transcribing old episodes. Let's talk about today's subject, Juan Cook Lee. Juan Cook Lee is the founder of Chung Do Kwan, one of the first nine schools that taught Tang Soo Do in the 1940s. He was also a student of the Shotokan karate founder, Gichin Funakoshi. Lee was born on April 13th, 1907 in Seoul, South Korea. During that time, Korea was under Japanese rule. There were many prohibitions imposed by the Japanese, and one of them was teaching or practicing martial arts of all sorts. It was illegal. So those who wanted to do martial arts had to leave the country and go to either China or Japan. And one day, when Lee was still young, he met a man named Mr. Kim, who was in his 60s. The old man told him that around 80 years prior to the Japanese occupation, people used to train in a Korean martial art called Taekyon. However, people with bad intentions, like the gangs, had used the martial art unlawfully Hence, the government ordered people to stop. Wealthy Korean families during that time usually sent their children to Japan to study at the best universities with the intention of expanding their connections for better chances of success in their lives. In 1926, Lee had the privilege to travel to Tokyo. He first attended high school and afterwards attended Chao University, one of the most prestigious institutions in Japan. There, he got the chance to know Gichin Funakoshi and his son, Gigo Funakoshi. Lee trained under the Funakoshis in Shotokan Karate and was able to achieve the highest rank among all practitioners who were not Japanese nationals. After Lee graduated from Chao University, he went on traveling to martial arts centers, including Okinawa and Shanghai, China. It never occurred to Lee that Korea would attain independence from Japan. In 1944, one year before the independence, Lee managed to return to his homeland with the help of some high-ranking Japanese officials. He even got a position at the Ministry of Transportation. Lee realized that the original Korean martial arts were being forgotten and just becoming part of history. So, in the same year, Lee sought permission from the government to teach Tang Soo Do, or Korean translation of Karate Do, in Korea. The government rejected his request twice. But on his third attempt, the government finally approved his petition and he started teaching at the Yongshin School Gymnasium in Seodunmin. Mm. Let's try that again. Seodunmin. I know I'm butchering that one. My apologies. District in Seoul. He named his very first school Chungdoquan, literally translated as School of the Blue Wave. When Korean independence came on August 15th, 1945, the entire country was in turmoil. There were riots among political groups, and some of them used Tang Soo Do against each other. This caused the government to release an order prohibiting the use of the martial art in any government facilities. Due to a series of unfortunate events, Lee was forced to move his school to the Sichungyo Church, located in Kyunji-dong, in Seoul. Lee did not have any sponsors or financers back then, so he used his own money and some small contributions to promote and teach Tang Soo Do. Eventually, the art became popular and the applications to his school increased greatly. As Lee knew that not all people could use the martial art in a good way, he became very careful in selecting his students and picked only those who showed seriousness. He did not want the image of Tang Soo Do to be ruined again because of gangs. He made it clear that Tang Soo Do's objective was to instill discipline and to serve as a moral guidance to his practitioners. It took him a year of teaching before the government recognized the many benefits of the martial art. He finally got financial support again from public institutions. He was also able to teach in various government institutions, such as the Korean Police General Headquarters and the Korean Army. From then on, Tang Soo Do became significant in the eyes of the government. Lee's Chung Do Kwan became very popular in a short period of time, and it reached around 5,000 registered members. President Syngman Rhee requested Lee that all these members become part of the Korean Republican Party. The president even offered Lee the post of Minister of Internal Affairs as a return for that favor. However, Lee felt uncomfortable with this. He thought that the president might have a hidden agenda, as the Chung Do Kwan members were all capable of fighting. 
his instinct proved to be correct when he was accused by the government of leading a group of assassins when he declined the offer. More than just false accusations, Lee, his wife, and some senior members of the school were beaten and tortured. Some were even killed, according to Lee. But still, he strongly stood by his principles and did not succumb to the government's desires. Finally, the country was liberated in 1950. Lee was more than happy for their liberation, but it was also the time when the war broke out between North and South Korea on June 25, 1950. Kim Il-sung led his communist forces against President Rhee. To avoid the conflict in the capital, Lee and his family fled far down south to Busan City, South Korea. They had no choice but to leave their home that was worth millions of dollars and never go back again. Soon after, in the same year, Lee and his wife arranged a flight to Japan and declared themselves political refugees. One day, he received news from the Russian ambassador to South Korea that Taekwondo was greatly accepted in North Korea. This was because of Yong jun yu one of his head instructors, who disappeared in North Korea but appeared later on. Yu promoted the art in the North, then returned to South Korea after the war. When Yu learned that Lee was still alive, he sent Lee photos of his students, proving that he was successful in teaching the art. He even enticed Lee to join him in North Korea. Most importantly, Lee received a personal invitation from Kim Il-sung himself to immigrate to the North. But Lee didn't accept any of these because he was strongly against the idea of communism. During the late 1940s and the early 1950s, many martial arts schools were established by Koreans who studied in Japan and learned karate. Lee was among the first Koreans, if not the very first, to establish a martial arts school teaching karate. They called the martial art Korean Karate. Lee preferred to use the Korean pronunciation or translation of karate do, which is Tang Sudo and means the way of the Chinese hand. The very first Tang Sudo schools taught the original katas from Okinawa, with maybe some hints of taekyong thrown in, according to some accounts, that were most likely developed by Gishin Funakoshi himself. According to Lee, when he was put to exile, his students performed a demonstration for President Syngman Rhee. The president referred to their art as Taekyong. However, the students felt a new name should be thought of to erase that negative connotation of the art being related to gang members. They consulted a Korean dictionary and eventually came up with the words Taekwondo. Lee explained why he named his school Chungdaekwon. This is a quote. I was seating at a bench in Korea, looking at the waves crash upon the shore. Suddenly, it came to me the name Blue Wave, Chungdo and I thought it would be a great name for the school. I didn't want to name my school Shotokan because a son should have a different name from his father. Lee was the first master of his school in 1944 before he stepped down from his position in 1950. The successor was Duk Sung Son from 1950 to 1959, who was also a co-founder of Taekwondo. Sun's efforts made Chungdaekwon the largest school in South Korea. However, due to internal conflicts with the original students, Son was replaced shortly by General Choi Hong Hee. Wun Kyu Um became the next master from 59 to 2017. Grandmaster Um passed away June 10, 2017, at age 88. At first, Lee strongly believed that Taekwondo should not be practiced as a sport, nor ever be included in the Olympics. Lee was worried that the attitude of the competitors might deviate from the true martial arts spirit. He didn't want the competitors to think only of winning, no matter the cost, while ignoring the moral principles of Taekwondo. However, Lee thought that if the judging would be fair, then the art could maybe be a sport. He hoped that executing the basic techniques perfectly would be a huge factor in the way they were judged. Chung De Kwan attained a nationwide popularity and reached 50,000 participants at its peak. New schools were also established teaching the same martial art in the late 40s and the early 50s, and many of those were directed by Lee's students. According to the World Taekwondo Federation, Taekwondo practitioners now number more than 70 million people around the world. Overall, Lee promoted six students to black belt. They were the first generation to be promoted by the Chung Duquan. Duk Song Sun, Su Chong Kang, Yun Jong Min, Um Wun Kyu, Yong Taek Chung, and Lee Yong Wu. Now in the second generation, were promoted by Duk Song Sun. I've got a number of names, but there's one that is important, and that's Choi Hong Hee, the founder of ITF, or to some, the founder of Taekwondo, and he was awarded an honorary fourth don in 52 and named the honorary chief of the school. When Lee retired from being the master of the Chung Duquan, he continued to promote the art by acting as a judge in tournaments, ranking promotions, and participating in various events. He was known to criticize any changes made to the art. In his free time, 
He used to visit his old students, who later became masters in their own right. Lee also influenced other masters, such as Yun Byung-in of YMCA Kwan Bok Club and Huang Ki of Muda Kwan. Lee and his wife immigrated to the United States in 1976 with the help of General William Westmoreland. General Westmoreland was a student of Lee in the 1960s when Lee served as an instructor to the U.S. Army. When Lee first applied for immigrant visa, he got rejected because of his arrest record in Korea. The general made the immigration possible by contacting the American embassy, and then Lee's visa was approved right away. Lee settled in Arlington, Virginia, together with his wife, and he spent his last years in calligraphy and acupuncture and welcomed interviews in different occasions. On February 2nd, 2003, Lee died of pneumonia in the hospital of Arlington. He was 95 years old. I find the stories of martial arts founders, and I suppose it's subjective whether or not we consider Wong Kuk Lee the founder or a contributor to Taekwondo, to Tang Soo Do, however you want to look at it. But what is important, what is clear, is that this man, through his own personal sacrifice, advanced the martial arts. He had a hand, whether large or small, in crafting what became Taekwondo. He had a hand in teaching others who helped advance the arts. And I think it's important that we understand as much as we can of the people who learned martial arts when not only was it not popular, but illegal. And to go through the things that they went through. I wouldn't still be teaching martial arts if the government came and beat me and my family. Would you? I doubt very few people today would. But here's a man who believes so strongly in the arts and in passing them on that he was willing to do that. As I said in the opener, if you want to check out the transcript with all the names that I butchered, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Don't forget, if you want to shop our products at whistlekick.com, you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. Uniforms, sparring gear, all kinds of great stuff. You can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com, and find us on social media. We are at Whistlekick. That's all I've got for you now. Hope you have a great day. Talk to you soon. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.